Hello everyone, it's time for our Yu Jing video. This one has been highly anticipated. After this one, uh, I don't really know where to go next. Uh, I could go anywhere. Well, I figured I'd leave it up to you guys. Why don't you comment on this and tell me where you would like me to go next. Uh, I believe we have Ariadna, uh, Hack Islam, the Nomads, the Combine, and the Toa. So you let me know where you want me to go next. The People's Republic of China, considered in its time to be a sleeping giant of Asia, took longer to awaken than the media had predicted. Capitalist socialism, the mongrel economic system that only the Chinese could bring to fruition, proved successful in driving their industry and economy forward via the controlled increase of foreign investments and influence. However, as the new economic model spread geographically and socially across China, the commitment of these Chinese to Maoist ideals started to fade against the glare of materialistic promises of the Western lifestyle. See, they saw this as almost like a cultural conquest. You had uh, a lot of the freewheeling uh, American ways making it onto places like the internet and people, you know, anybody can log on to YouTube and see a lot of these videos. The blooming Western industries of leisure and entertainment permeated the hitherto ideologically pure Chinese rural society. Economic success had sharply increased the income of the rural population, turning poor farmers into increasingly empowered customers. In order to overcome this looming ideological crisis, China had to reinvent itself, turning once again to the quintessential Chinese political resource. Change everything so that everything stays the same. Mao, and his ideas, already bruised by the Cultural Revolution, was increasingly eroded by the generations raised in the rejection of dogmas. No emperor, no gods, no Maoism, no Taoism, no Buddhism. Nothing of what had defined Chinese identity since ancient times. China set out to regain its historical pride. Traditional values were brought to the forefront, but always filtered by the party agenda. Historical religions and world views were endorsed as long as they remained under state oversight. They needed a distinctive figurehead on which to focus the admiration of the people, to represent them and symbolize the new order. This would be the dragon, the emperor. The descendants of the Ming and Qing dynasty were located and the seat of the emperor was restored, not as a symbol of China alone, but of an entirely new nation. This emergent world power baptized as Yu Jing, literally the Jade Capital, would face the future by embracing China's history, both modern and ancient. The change of the name came about as a result of China's explosive growth. Economic expansion into satellite countries was followed by political annexation. North Korea, Mongolia, Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Taiwan, Nepal, and Bhutan eventually joined the new Chinese project and were assimilated as new Chinese prefectures under an agreement that they would be able to maintain key aspects of their cultural identities. See what I mean there? They're like, all right, yeah, you can be part of our society, but you need to, uh, you can maintain certain parts of your uh, initial culture, but you're going to have to conform a little bit to, to the state and, and what we need. Japan and South Korea, whose economies were still in disarray after the so-called stock market crunch of, of the decade, were unable to survive the loss of the bloated North American market, and the receding European markets were of little help. On the brink of economic disaster and social upheaval, the leaders of both nations decided to tie their futures to China's. This decision caused social tremors that can still be felt today particularly in Japan, where many felt their national pride had been sold out. When we discussed pan or initially, we talked about how that stock market crash in North America really hurt the entire world, and it came to fruition here as well. They have invested a lot in American businesses and American trade, and, and we're basically in a world economy. So when one thing goes down, all those investments are now null and void. They're meaningless. 
So that's how Pan O could actually step in was was they didn't help uh, China's failing social you know social economy. Uh, they ended up helping themselves and were able to thrust a little bit more forward using that isolationist kind of ordeal. In order to soothe the inflamed spirits of those alienated by the Chinese presence and to refute accusations of cultural imperialism on top of political imperialism, it was decided that a new immense country needed a new name. In this way, its new inhabitants could avoid identifying themselves as being Chinese and go on feeling Korean or Vietnamese or Mongol or etc. That is how China became Eugene, a country that, as soon as it secured control over half of Asia, set its sights on the stars. See, 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 that's a brilliant plan. China's always been kind of seen, you know, through all the battles that all these Asian nations have had with China, throughout the history of China, you can have a lot of bad blood. But this new, it's Eugene. This is all brand new. It's not China. It has nothing to do with China. It's Eugene. You're Korea, but you're Korean Yuching, you know? So it's, it's a brilliant plan. Yuching politicians were skeptical about the benefits of space exploration. Convinced that was a fad that would simply cost Pan Oceana dearly for little benefit. Therefore, when the discovery of Neo Terra finally proved the true potential of jump portals, Yuching was lagging several years behind Pan Oceana in space research and development. To remedy this, research funds were immediately redistributed and entire universities were repurposed with the support of the strong Yujing private industry capable of building anything science might need. Soon afterward, but not before, the discovery of Akata Cemento, Yujing located a system with not one but two fertile viable planets. The new star system had several peculiarities, the most salient of which were the two identically locked inhabitable planets. This effectively doubled the available space for colonization, which helped relieve the overpopulation problems Yujing faced at the time. In an attempt to appease the different nations that had joined Yujing and now struggled for recognition and to demonstrate the commitment of the government to space colonization, the capital was moved to the new system, which was simply named Yujing, the Jade Capital, the paradise in the heavens. The Yuching block now encompassed three separate territories, the capital planet Yutang, its twin planet Shangtang, and the Far East territories on Earth called Chunko. Not wanting to lag behind, they started advancing their colonizing ships and establishing a base on the Pan-Oceana controlled Svalerheima. Naturally, this created a great deal of political tension between Pan-Oceana and Yujing, which the joint discovery in colonization of Paradiso only exacerbated. The numerous border conflicts between the colonies on Paradiso and Svalerheima eventually snowballed into neo-colonial wars. This becomes a big part of a lot of history. We'll cover that in another video, but it's big. The neo-colonial wars affected a lot of different nations. As a result of the O12 determination that put an end to the neo-colonial wars, Yuching and Pan Oceana reluctantly agreed to share colonization rights over Paradiso. However, the Combine Army invasion has completely altered the political landscape of that system, whose undeniable appeal is eclipsed by the looming alien threat. Regaining contact with the Don Ariadna system, still largely unexploited, turned a new page in the politics of the sphere. Initial reports speak of a tessium rich planet which makes mining rights a primary concern. This time, Eugene is ready to jump ahead of Pan Oceana in the production of this value nanomaterial. The party has made it abundantly clear that no effort will be spared in obtaining the beneficial outcome for Yujing. What we're next going to discuss is the way Yujing likes to govern their system. It's a lot like the Sith rule, if, if that can uh, be equated at all. It's very much, there's got to be one person and then a person directly opposed to that person. and the scheming and all that that happens in between is what benefits the politics as a whole, as you'll see. It's the balance of power. There is one feature that represents the Yu Qing society and its politics. It is the balance of power and influence. 
every single religious, political, economic, and social source of power has a counterbalance in the direct opposition that stops it from claiming complete control. Some have theorized that this Yujing penchant for balance of opposites is a result of the deep-seated Taoist mentality of its citizens. Although the state empire endorses no official state religion, three denominations constitute the beliefs of the majority of its population. Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism. In the state empire, political power is shared between the party and the emperor. The party governs the Yu Jing, and the emperor must accept its resolutions. The emperor, on the other hand, has complete autonomy in his control over the judiciary system. The imperial seat is also shared between two dynasties, as we spoke of before. Whenever one holds the title, the other conspires against it to try to cripple its authority and make it lose face. It's like the rule of two, like I was saying. The party, a Yu Jing iteration of the old Chinese Communist Party, is the touchstone of political life and the repository of the country's power. Its hermetic, underhanded character has been compared to that of Masonic Lod. The party indeed behaves like an extremely powerful, influential brotherhood, one that is often ominously mysterious. Once inside the party, however, careers can either rise in a blast of success or nosedive into a bottomless pit, depending on one's ability to navigate the murky waters of internal politics. The party uses the Ministry of Information to bombard its citizens with propaganda and quickly science any voices that fail to tow the party line. Despite appearances, the party is not a monolithic in its actions or its opinions. Internally, the party is split into two major factions, the Old Guard, extreme leftists that defend the party's political tradition, and the New Wave, a younger reformist that push for the party to take advantage of the best aspects of capitalism while rejecting the worst. It is that du dueling way of philosophy again. You've got the, the old guard who's like, we don't want change. And you have the new guys saying, we want nothing but change. Tensions and disputes within the party are an everyday occurrence. Each time the government must discuss a new approach or a bill it proposed, the city bustles with frenetic activity. Deals, packs, and alliances are struck in hallways and cafeterias and broken in halls and councils just a few hours later. Any citizen could potentially be eligible for resurrection in Yuching, but only those who prove beyond a doubt they deserve it really stand a chance in front of the resurrection committee. In massive, all-inspiring resurrection ceremonies, the year's lucky few are celebrated by the party and the people of Yuching, who voice their hopes that the resurrected will continue to work for the good of their nation. The promise of resurrection is an invaluable tool in the hands of the party, and the Ministry of Information makes a point in keeping it in the forefront of all citizens' minds with the propaganda. The party needed a politically neutral symbol that would not alienate any groups, one that could be supported by a majority of its new nation's citizens. He would be the perfect link with its glorious past and its traditions. A further advantage of an emperor figure less politically aligned than the president of a republic would be that he would generate less controversy while still serving the image building purposes of the new country. He needed to become more than a mere figurehead for the government. In a well publicized maneuver, the party delegated its judicial powers to the emperor, renouncing to some of its all encompassing control in the nod towards separation of powers in an inauguration of the golden age to come. Think about it, it's not really power, it's more the illusion of power. You can judge all the people we deem as criminals, and you can come up with the punishments for them. We're still judging who is the criminal and who is not the criminal. You're just telling them what to do after they've been judged criminals. To protect the new monarchy from what would seem an inevitable decline into apathy and abuse, they created what we know as the imperial system. Another one of those dueling systems. The imperial system is the name of the alternating arrangement for the succession of the imperial throne. When the party went in search of the descendant of the imperial dynasty, they found instead a bitter, outstanding dispute. The last imperial dynasty of China had been the Qing, of the Manchurian origin. They rose to power after overthrowing the Ming dynasty and were perceived by many in their time as usurpers unworthy of the imperial title. This quarrel left a mark in the Chinese collective subconscious, 
and even the party was divided into support for either family. The final decision was Solomonic. Both dynasties would alternate in the exercise of power. This built-in rotation arrangement ensures that neither dynasty can grow and become a problem. The imperial system forces both families to compete eternally, each thwarting the other's ambitions for power and influence. In order to qualify for the position of emperor, all young claimants of the upcoming dynasty are required to study law and legislation and to excel in their studies. The Tian Dain Jing Law School, by far the most prestigious in the human sphere, was once part of the State Empire University, but excised itself in order to become an imperial school exclusively dedicated to educating members of the two imperial families and students preparing to join the judicial corps or imperial service. The emperor wields considerable influence over the entire judicial court. So too strong, formed of the magistracy, the prosecution, the judiciary police, and its tactical branch, the imperial service, and over every member of the judiciary individually. In addition to judicial corps, the emperor has at his disposal the imperial agent section to act as his direct representatives in distant lands or when he decides against traveling. The task of the imperial agents is to follow the direct orders of the emperor and investigate the most prominent or sensitive cases. Their job description includes traveling around Yuqing to interrogate intimidate. Some units of the section are built as elite corps of the imperial personal guard, and their members are selected and appointed by the emperor himself. Imperial agents have carte blanche to act as they see fit and may requisition anything they need in the performance of their mission. As the head of the Judiciary Center of Confucian Doctrine, the Emperor has the Aleph granted power of managing the resurrections of everyone in the Imperial Court and the Judicial System. The Emperor, advised by Aleph, decides who will be resurrected and who will not. However, ironically, his power over life and death does not extend to himself. The resurrection of the Emperor lies in the hands of the party, which decide whether the Emperors have been worthy of an extended life or not. The Yujing laws of succession prevent any resurrected party from sitting on the Jade Throne. Additionally, the resurrection of the Emperor has a delay of several years to avoid accumulation of power. Resurrected Emperors are barred from participating in political life of the court and live in retirement palaces all over Chumko. The Imperial Palace is the most striking symptom of the differences between splendor of the Imperial system and the pragmatic sobriety of the party. But despite this overly emphasized displays of imperial power, the dragon is leashed and the party holds the collar. Nothing that the emperor does goes unnoticed, and disregarding the boundaries set by the party can have the emperor dethroned, or worse. An illuminating example is one of the third emperor, Qing Jeda. By the end of its mandate, he started abusing his power, neglecting his duties, being biased in his interpretation of the law criticizing the party and trying to establish stronger bonds with the military leadership in order to secure his position. The subsequent ideological crisis threatened to topple not only the imperial system, but all of Yuqing. However, the situation resolved itself when the accidental death of the emperor, who fell down a flight of stairs while under the influence. Ever since, no other emperor of Yuqing has declared pro- This is a result of the Yuqing policy of dispersing its colonists across both planets following ethnical and cultural group patterns. Yu Tang, the capital and seat of the imperial throne, mostly reserved for Chinese ethnicities. Shang Tang, on the other hand, was populated by colonists from the other ancient countries absorbed by Yu Qing, who then settled in cultural specific regions. The vast northeastern Shang Tang province, Kojiro, is named by the mainly Korean settlers that populated these ethnically distinctive areas have at least two official languages, their own and the Yuqing language, called, you guessed it, Yuqing. The Yuqing State Empire is currently involved in sphere-wide infiltration campaign with the goal of staging a massive power grab. A top secret report shows that using the consortium of top Yuqing companies, agents of the Yang Jing, the Eyes, the Yuqing Military Intelligence Service, the underground triad organizations, a series of bridgeheads have been established, waiting for the favorable time for Yujing to obtain surreptitious control over the goings-on of the human sphere. The Qingdao report, named after the city where the investigations began, was requested by the Bureau Hermes, the Commerce and Economy Department of O12. The com 
and compiled by agents of the Bureau Noir, the O12 Secret Service. The original draft of the report was redacted due to its grave political and economic military implications. A toned down version, however, was started making rounds around the concilium. Experts corroborate the Changdao report, claims that Yu Jing has been using the O12 as a bridgehead for its plans of conquest and homogeny over the whole sphere. Despite the report, it seems Bureau Noir and the Hexahedron, the Pan Oceania Intelligence Service, are officially unaware of the sinister nature of the tangled Yu Jing tendrils spread throughout their territory. However, the original version of the report had to fight the Pan Oceania investment and commercial lobbies, who feared the revelations would negatively affect business opportunities forecast by the lifting blockade of Nefelheim, region of Svalerheim. In the last year alone, Yu Jing invested nearly a trillion yen in the purchase of concilium companies in strategic business areas. Many of these companies have links to Panoceanan corporations. The commercial bonds established by Yu Jing with the Panoceanan enterprise have opened the door for Yu Jing operations of unprecedented scale within Panoceanan territory. Panoceanan is simply a primary target and O12 and the concilium are Trojan horses. The goal of Yu Jing is to conquer and subjugate the entire human sphere, but first it must defeat the only world power capable of standing in its way. Pan Oceana must stand firm against this threat. Test the constraints of the imperial system or neglect his responsibilities. If you could visit both planets of Yu Jing's system, you would be able to appreciate the different demographic weight of the country's combined cultures and coerce anyone who might help crack a case to satisfy the curiosity of the dragon. The Jade Capital is protected by one of the most powerful armies in the sphere. The Yu Jing army combines the ancestral techniques of its martial traditions with cutting-edge technology, and the result is unbeatable. The skill of Shaolin monks, the stealth of ninjas, the stalwartness of the Gojia could attest to this, but the key to the state empire army is its heavy infantry. High Command decided to translate the workings of the armed forces into a variety of types of heavy infantry capable of adapting to any warfare condition or requirement. Yu Jing made servo-powered armors that are the best in the market. More lightweight, easier to maintain, but the excellence of the Yu Jing heavy soldier is due to the intense training, iron discipline, and tactical outlook that puts them in the thick of things where they can make a difference and be a deciding element in combat. The Yu Jing tactical deployment capabilities are built upon the so-called Invincible Army, a military force composed of differently specialized heavy infantry units. Each of these units can perform operational roles usually ascribed to what in other armies would be a medium or light infantry, or even skirmisher and support units. Naturally, the servo-powered armors of the Yu Jing troops confer on them superior effectiveness and survival rates compared to their lighter counterparts. The Invincible Army was born during the military reform pushed by the then Minister of Defense, Sang Huan. It was an attempt to modernize and improve the old military paradigm of massive quantities of barely trained light infantry soldiers. As a requisite measure, the flow of military research money was diverted towards R&D and bodily protection. Soon, new servo-powered armors, stronger and more resilient, were being produced. Simultaneously, the Yu Jing military combed the human sphere for the best training officers they could recruit or hire and built modern instructional camps for them. The Yu Jing military industry rose to the challenge, ramping up mass production and new armor suits without compromising quality. This opened the door for the creation of a range of specialist suits based on the standard invincible model, known as the bird's beak due to the characteristic helmet, including an inexpensive lightweight version, the Xiaowang model, and reinforced heavy support option, the Yang Ho. Superior customized features were created to respond to specific operational needs, infiltration, camouflage, or surveillance. The rapid technological evolution of invincible armor soon made the bird's beak model obsolete as a Yujing standard, and is now being recalled in favor of the more approved model, Shang Ji. The Yu Jing State Empire is a reflection of the energy of the entire Asian continent. The Japanese are the source of both success and concern for the State Empire. Success for their powerful technological industry, a major support to sustain Yu Jing in the race for technological primacy of the sphere. Success because Korimori, the Japanese region of the planet Shangtang, is one of the most prosperous in the, of the State Empire. 
success also for the bravery of the Japanese troops who integrated into the Eugene Japanese army fight in the service of the state empire throughout the sphere. But it also has problems because the great many of the haughty Japanese are not deposed to submit their will to the dictates of the party, nor to permit themselves to be considered second-class citizens, much less to relinquish their independence. This hostile attitude has come to manifest itself in a violent manner with the emergence of terrorist groups like the Taitanaki and the Kapuntai. The Japanese ethnicity has staunchly maintained its own identity as much from national pride as reaction to official and unofficial attitudes of the Yuqin government towards them. The Chinese have not been able to overcome the prejudices that have always been held towards the Japanese. The flame of hatred for the atrocities committed by the Japanese during the Second World War has remained alive in the Chinese collective subconscious. A part of the Japanese populace has always been reluctant to fully integrate, embracing their patriotic sentiment as the means of passive protest. The Eugene government, very sensitive to what it considers ideological threats, has always considered the Japanese as politically suspect, treating them with a heavy hand and an iron fist. As you can imagine, why do you think these terrorist groups started to pop up? both positions so extreme and confrontational not only seem irreconcilable they feed one another with a continuous loop of occasional flashes of brutal violence that threaten the peace and stability of all of Eugene. In any society the existence of different layers of social classes is inevitable. Normally the category of different individuals that compose the society is determined by economic markers. However in Eugene case it's particularly different the level of each person's citizenship can be determined by their ethnic origin. Any Yujing individual belonging to the Japanese or Ugbar or other Chinese Muslim ethnicities will be considered a second class citizen with the same duties but fewer rights than all the rest. For example, a second class citizen does not have the right to state empire provided cube. They have limited access to Maya in public demonstrations must be limited to their own cultural roots such as languages, outfits, and traditional customs. So imagine that. I can protest by wearing a shirt. That's as far as I can protest. You can wear a shirt that says, I love being Korean. <laughs> That's as far as I can go with my protest. <laughs> so, yeah. That definitely you would feel like they're ruling you with an iron fist. Before its annexation to Eugene, Japan was a nation in the midst of economic and political and social crisis. It had fallen from full economic power into a critical situation, dragged down by the American decadence. Economic, from an economic point of view, integration into Yuqing appeared the best choice to ensure the country's survival. The ruling political economic class of Japan found itself in direct opposition with part of the population and, above all, numerous right-wing opposition groups. These groups recovered the work of Yukio Mishima as inspiration as a banner for their movement. In this moment, Mishima had been very critical of what he considered an unhealthy preoccupation with money and foreign values. The withdrawal of all titles from Japanese imperial family was the straw that broke the camel's back. So imagine that. Yeah, your emperor, you, I guess you can call him that, but he has absolutely no title, no land, no power. In one of Mishima's essays, A Defense of Culture, he argues that the emperor is the source of Japanese culture and that to defend the emperor is to defend Japanese culture. Opponents cried out in favor of civil insurrection. There were demonstrations and riots, but the Japanese and Yuqing authorities were relentless and the first attempts at rebellion were suffocated. In spite of the difficulties, the opposition made inroads and serendipitously created the Tetanaki. The Society of the Shield, a private security arm made up of young patriots dedicated to reviving Bushido, the ancient code of honor of the samurai warriors. Studying martial arts, guerrilla tactics, and urban sabotage. The objectives of the Tatenaki are to free Japan of Yujing domination and return the Japanese imperial family to the throne through violence and direct action. The Society of the Shield endows each of its members with a warrior attitude in which samurai fighting is applied to politics. At one point, the Tatanaki organized several attacks, all of them very bloody and with several victims. 
The savagery of its methods turned the stomachs of all Eugene citizens. Communications, media, and many politicians of the party began to make declarations full of sweeping generalizations, and soon all Japanese were considered terrorists, accomplices, or accessories. You can see the propaganda machine in play. Uh, we see it a lot of times today. Uh, government attacks one government that's severely weaker than the initial government, and their only recourse is to, you know, for their citizens to attack, and, you know, they do terrorist action, and then the whole world can go, see how bad these terrorists are. See how we should all hate them because they... They hurt these innocent people, but they bomb the innocent people themselves all the time. As a result of the activities of the Society of the Shield, the state empire repealed the first class citizenship status for all Japanese. This decree was accompanied by a series of measures and restrictions. Use of the Japanese language in official events, even within Japanese territory, has been forbidden. Traditional holidays cannot be celebrated. The public use of Japanese traditions and customs cannot be considered, and Japanese companies must pay an extra tax or fee to the state empire. So you see how a couple little terrorist acts by one group of people, so it wasn't Japanese citizens, it was these young kids started a group, they called the Tatanaki, they attacked some people, but now all of Japan has to suffer. The abuse of certain middle and high ranking officers and the careless attitude towards the lives of the Japanese soldiers professed by certain high command generals has provoked the appearance of a clandestine organization called the Kempatai. The Kempatai, to a certain point, a replica of the Tatanaki but within the state empire army. The principal differences between the two organizations are moral and operational. The Kempentai are confined to military sphere, carrying out target assassinations without killing citizens. The Kempentai act as a secret military police that punishes those of the Yujing military who needlessly endanger the lives of Japanese troops. The Japanese have become accustomed to their status and many are trying to gain recognition in Yujing society and to change things from within, demonstrating that they are valuable citizens with much to contribute. Japanese citizens are increasingly obtaining full citizenship certificates by demonstrated loyalty to the ideals of the state empire. Obviously, the Japanese resistance considers such people as to be traitors and collaborators. The technological samurai are the social and military elite of the Yujing ethnic Japanese. The prestige of their rank also implies their exemplary attitude and complete acceptance and adherence to the ancient and demanding code of chivalry. The Bushido, the path of the samurai, the Japanese code of the warrior, forges the bravest, most honorable, most unconquerable warriors on the battlefield. The samurai must live immersed in the internal present. For him there is no possibility of tomorrow. Acceptance of death is the key to Bushido. The samurai knows that each day is his last because in each battle he is willing to die rather than fail. Severe discipline and hard training are not enough. It is necessary to possess an extraordinary sense of honor and duty that is rare in the current era. Only upon reaching an absolute acceptance of death is the mastery of the path of the samurai achieved and one can enter into the samurai regiments of the Yujing State Empire Army. The Domaru, the Oyori, and even the Harumaki, samurai of spirit but not of origin, are the elite Japanese military forces. When discussing the modern Yujing samurai, you'd be hard pressed not to mention the mystical halo around them that hints at warriors with apparently superhuman abilities of heroes driven by strict philosophical rules. Apart from Bushido, the way of the samurai, one of the main features of Bushi, modern day Japanese culture samurai, is the practice of Zen Buddhism. This practice completely determines their philosophy and behavior and is ultimately responsible for the military success and the social caste of warriors. Through Zen, the Bushi conceives of combat as a philosophical conflict that unfolds first within the warrior's mind. The goal is to go beyond mere weapon proficiency in order to achieve true mastery. Zen is based on an inner search and teaches that strength lies entirely within oneself. This personal strength can be fed and made to grow through an effort in that inner search. The purpose of Zen is to achieve perfection, to achieve mastery. A state in which not even the smallest gap exists between a person's will and their actions. The samurai warrior, as a Zen practitioner, 
is to lose awareness of execution and sensation of performing an action. When perfection is achieved, the action is effortless and replicates faithfully and with precision the scene pictured in the sam within the samurai. When will and action are the same thing, one is truly a master. The willingness of the bushi to live as a dead man, free of tension, makes forever prepared fighters willing to go in the extra mile. Their value as shock troopers cannot be overstated. Illustrative of this is the recent record of victories by bushi regiments such as the Dumaru, Harumaki, and the Oyori from the neo-colonial wars and the Paradiso conflicts. But there is a key aspect of the contribution these modern samurai make to the war effort, and it often goes overlooked. I'm alluding to their active part in the development of Yujing military technology. Their quest for perfection make the Bushi the perfect test subjects for servo-powered armor prototypes. Thanks to their Zen outlook, when asked to put these experimental ar armor systems to the test, they use the same determination that drives their martial training. Once a project reaches the test branch, Yujing Ministry of Defense assigns a Dumaru or Harumaki specialist to its development team as an authorized consultant. Suggestions from the Bushi consultants are carefully considered for their final assessment is decisive in the evaluation of each project. Owing to the input of these technological samurai, Yujing research centers can precisely adjust their prototypes for optimal performance, part of the reason why their armors are famed as the best in the sphere. The planet Yutang is the nucleus of Yuching, and it's here the capital of Tian Di Jing, whose name literally means the capital of Heavenly Emperor. Tian Di Jing is the seat of the empire's government, the Gordian knot of the power in Yuching. In the northern area of the city, you will find the governing bodies of the nation and the seat of the party, a very modern looking executive slash bureaucratic area. The Astro Port, built over the sea, is the artificial island surrounded by an impressive nautical sports harbor. To the east of this huge and dynamic city, we find the University Campus, famous for its prestigious Imperial Law faculty, where young hopefuls from Imperial families study, as well as many members of the Imperial Court. In the southern zone is the Forbidden City the Imperial Palace, which stands out in the rest of the city like a beautiful jewel on a simple gold ring. Home of the Emperor, housing as well as the nobles, the entire Imperial Court and Imperial Supreme Court. The Forbidden City is a huge park 13 kilometers long in which all the beauty of nature and the Chinese architecture are mixed in perfect harmony of forms and colors that overwhelm and amaze the spectator. Sumptuous temples and palaces, labyrinths formed by lakes and pavilions in the interior of the islands, rivers which flow through wooden groves, silent waterfalls and hidden grottos, pools filled with lotuses and elegant swans swimming, pebbled trails that seem to have no end, long beds of exotic flowers, hidden caves with shining golden statues inside, splendidly synchronized fountains. Mystery and wonder are present in the design of the Forbidden City. All of these elements combined with an unimaginable perfection which can be only equaled by Haklazamite gardeners. The official media is constantly talking about endless fight between the Imperial services and the enemies of the state empire, both foreign and domestic. But what is seldom mentioned is just how convenient it is for the party and the government that these enemies exist, especially the domestic kind. The existence of organizations such as the Triads, the Juan Juan Pirates, and particularly the Nepalese terrorist groups, both the indiscriminate Tenonaki and the military Kempuntai is sanctioned by the Imperial Service, who sees them as necessary threats for the Eugene government to survive. It is beyond doubt that many of these threats should have already been surmounted in a society as tightly controlled as Yuching's in which imperial service has such free reign, legal protection, and even immunity. But it is equally obvious that having one or several domestic enemies helps such a desperate society as Yu Jing's stay close-knit in spite of its differences in ethnicities and cultures. It's like that common threat thing, you know, if we all hate the other guy, then we can all band together. It's a little easier. Remember how in here in America, how uh, patriotic we were after 9-11?
Having a foreign adversary like Pan Oceana helps strengthen this sense of community, of belonging to a nation, by comparison with the other. Against the adversary, the stranger, one seeks the protection of the group, overlooking the differences and focusing on the shared aspects. In times of peace and prosperity, when this effect is not enough, a domestic threat becomes necessary. The domestic enemy, be it criminal or terrorist, helps keep the party in power, and Yu Qing united as a nation with its own marks of identity. Thus, the Imperial Service uses the threats as a pretext for its questionable modus operandi and its role as an instrument of control and repression for the benefit of the state empire government, but not for its citizens. Well, that's it for this week. Like I said, comment on this video and let me know what faction you would like me to take over first. Of course, like I stated before, I will be going in depth on a lot of these sectorials, a lot of the different equipment and things like that in later videos. I just need to get all the factions out first. If you like tabletop gaming, comics, or just laughing, you should check out my tabletop gaming and podcasting channel. The Tabletop Talkers with a Z. If you're interested at all in the lore of Iron Kingdoms, we have another companion channel called Allocating Focus, which deals with the lore of the Iron Kingdoms, the War Hordes, War Machine Hordes setting. That's it for this week. Good luck and take care.